the power to make a vote to remove commissioners and put commissioners on. Uh, I, I just don't see what vehicle we use to get the eight of us off, get the old eight back and re-sworn in. Uh, I don't see where we have the legal authority to even accept this offer. Now, I could see where a judge could order this, where a judge could, you know, if we took this to court and they said we violated the Sunshine Law, so we had to have one of those infamous do-overs. Uh, but I don't see where we have the authority just to accept this. And could you explain how we have the authority to accept it? That's how we do it. Um, this is the only way to do it. I'm not suggesting that there aren't legal issues involved in the process. I mean, there certainly are. Um, this is a situation that, um, best I can tell, I mean, certainly we're faced with 12 appointments. And I don't know that that's ever occurred in, in, the, uh, in the history of of our state. Um, it presents other legal issues. The legal issues are that you have 12, you have eight commissioners and four county-wides that are in office. Um, but the question becomes whether they're, um, whether the action taken by this body um, was valid. And this is the only way to resolve it. Um, there might be uh, a lawsuit or two generated because of the redo. Um, I, I see that as a possibility. But this is the only way to cure it, and it is the offer that's on the table. And who could vote on it? This commission. As the, not, the present 19 commissioners. That's right. They're the ones that have the legal authority right now to vote on it. Mr. Chairman. It's hard to put your mind around. I, you yeah, know, I, I agree, Commissioner Lambert. It, it is. It's very difficult to put your mind around. Now, I, I would contend that this would put the eight that have been appointed at a conflict of interest where they couldn't vote on this resolution. And that would put it back to the 11 of us, uh, uh, whether we were going to accept this or not. Because I would certainly feel like if I had been appointed that it would be a conflict of interest of whether I was going to vote to uphold my appointment or or throw my appointment out. I mean, that's that's a clear conflict of interest. So it comes back to the same thing that we wanted to avoid in the first place, which is 11 people deciding uh, uh, how we were going to resolve this. We followed the law. We did exactly what the Supreme Court told us to do, and uh, and I think we need to uh, we need to stick to our guns on this. Mr. Ballard. Yes, <clears throat> I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, how many violations would it take for them to be successful in their lawsuit? Two. Would it be, would it be one? Yeah. Any violation of the Open Records Act, it means Act brings about the remedy, right? Well, I'm asking the law director that. Yeah. I'd like to know, too. <laughs> the Act says any violation, but you have to... Um, you have to determine whether any potential violation occurred prior to the meeting or during the meeting. Did it apply to each and every appointment? Well, that's, that was my question is, is that if, if let's say there's a violation for one appointment, would that throw out the other 11 or would, you have, or would they have to prove a violation for each appointment? In my opinion, it would not throw out the other 11. Well, that was the question that I was getting around to. What happens is if the court doesn't put it on the expedited uh, docket and it occurs after the February 8th or 2008 election? You're assuming that the court would find a violation? No, no. What would happen if it's delayed beyond the election? The court hearing. Court hearing, yes. Yeah. If the court hears the case and decides our case following the February 12 primary, is that what you're saying? Well, well let me ask another way. Will it be heard before that, before the election? I do not know. There's no um, court hearing that's been set. Mr. Hollow did request in his complaint that the case be expedited, but there's been no move to do that, and we still have or a few days or so yet to answer the complaint. I think probably the first or second or so of March, third of March. 
And I guess my question to you, since we brought up executive committee and uh, questions during the uh, open forum in this setting, which is the easiest way to, because if we meet with you in executive committee, and I don't really understand that quite as well as I would like to, then we really, it's really just you telling us we have no input. Uh, you, can, you can talk with me directly in executive session. You can respond to my question. Um, and I can give you information. Uh, the thing that we're prohibited from doing in executive session under Tennessee law is talking with each other. You cannot talk with each other. So if a person asks you a question and somebody has a follow-up question talking directly to you, is, is that kosher? Yes. So long as it's related to the litigation, and certainly we are in litigation, um, all, nine, all um, 19 members of this body and all 12 of the uh, of the new commissioners are sued as well. Or uh, all eight of the new commissioners and four countywides, and the previous eight um, commissioners that served through January 31. And are you in a position that you can recommend which form you think that would be the best served to handle to handle this? What do you mean, which form? Or whether it be an open or executive? Yes. I mean, I, I, I believe that, you know, the lawsuit is um, very public. The, um, the settlement offer is certainly um, going to be public. And so, you know, my response to you would be basically what I've just told you. I don't know that I would tell you anything different than I just told you in an executive session. Um, but in an executive session, you couldn't vote on it. That's and correct. Up here, can't talk can to vote. each other. Then we can vote on it that day. That's right. It wouldn't be extended. That's right. Cannot vote on it. Can take no action in an executive session. It is not a business session. Commissioner Moore. I guess, uh, Mr. Law Director, I, I heard what you said, and it's all coming like to the commission. Our uh, it is your depositions decision. and our phone records and our but but. The, but it has to go the other way too. You know, I think we'll get their depositions and their cell phone records and their uh, notes of, of the violations. We fully intend to explore discovery for Knox County. So, you know, my my thought is they've sued us. And you need to defend it, and we, I guess we'll see them in court. Commissioner Luthold. Well, this sort of extended into more commissioners than on the committee, because the other committee, I guess, would have to address it, too. To seem to vote on an issue that basically says there's eight people here who are going to vote on something that, by definition, aren't here. Okay? So if we're not here then we don't have a voice. And I don't know what that means, because first of all, we're not party to this lawsuit other than through Knox County, but if we don't exist as part of Knox County government, then I don't know how we vote on on, on an issue. Uh, we had a, year before last, we had a, a huge wedding down there. Uh, I don't recall what the cost was that they had no right to make. The county would not be exempt from being sued from such cases. Would we have a, a, a defense? Would we, certainly, would we certainly have a position that any acts taken by the officials that were sworn in um, on or about January 31 that are in office now, that whatever acts they have taken in office are legitimate. And those eight commissioners used to be in office, can they be compelled as any legislator to attend? Of course not. Um, you can't be compelled to be here. Would you um, still, for the purposes of the revote, would you be considered a Knox County Commissioner? Yes. Do you have to attend? No. Did you resign? Yes. And you, you would have all kinds of options as a commissioner. 
but what happens to 